Uh, it's great to be here today and to talk about a small tool that started some years ago. Um, I hope that you're not too tired from your partying of last night. Um, so we will do a kind of quick talk and we will make kind of interview-like uh, presentations. Um, and I will maybe start right away about why we um, started to work on CV search. Um, you know, when you start to do software developments, you do it because maybe of frustrations. And uh, for the past year, we, I was a bit frustrated on not finding the right tool for doing vulnerability assessment, especially to search into uh, all the vulnerabilities that are uh, available for software and so on. And one of the key elements that was um, a kind of a paradox, uh, some years ago, when we wanted to do CV search, the only source of information was basically NIST. And if you want to do search for your vulnerable software, you had to go to a US-based website. Um, so for us, it was like, oh, yeah, is it really a good idea to do uh, HTTP search query over the internet to uh, search for about information about vulnerable software and so on? So that was one of the first requirements that we had to find a way to do offline search, uh, to, be, to have local search directly inter internally and not you know, propagate those search onto the internet. Something else that we, we wanted to have is, as you know, a lot of people are using intrusion detection systems or network intrusion detection systems. So basically, you capture a lot of uh, network packet captures, traffic, and you want to do fast lookup. So if you have, a, you know, if you have to, to query a remote services from the internet to basically look up for vulnerable software, uh, for you doing pen testing or for doing regular assessment of your infrastructure, it's not really possible. So that's why we were wanted to design a, such kind of software. Another problem that we see uh, regularly is basically for uh, vulnerability descriptions, they are not localized. So that means, depending of your localizations, sometimes ge geographic loca localizations, depending of your business act of activities, you want to better localize the vulnerabilities. And uh, that's something that we re really wanted to have in our uh, software, is to be able to localize and classify vulnerabilities. Uh, because the surface of attack might be different from one organization to the others. Something else that we wanted to have is to have a kind of flexible data structures. Um, as you know, information security is a big mess. I think it's not a, a lie, but it's something that we face every day. Uh, if you see vendors providing information about their vulnerabilities, uh, they provide sometimes web pages in the best cases. Um, forget about parsing them. It's not very uh, flexible. So we wanted to have a software where we could basically gather as much as information that we can get from the software vendors and put them in a two, uh, into a flexible data structure. And I think from the first presentation that we have seen this morning, um, you see that a lot of people use Unix-like tools. Uh, you want to script everything you do you, for pen testing, for evaluation, for security assessment. And we wanted to basically create a tools where you can use Unix-like tools uh, for doing uh, um, research into vulnerabilities. And basically, based on that, we want to provide a free software that people can use and even build new tools to improve security. So it was a kind of big goal. Uh, but all, all on all, everything started uh, was uh, in 2012. I was looking for um, a software for, for doing a CV search. And by crawling the internet, I find out a, a small script from uh, Wim Remes. I don't know if Wim is here. No. Um, Wim, basically what he did, he did uh, start tools to fetch data from NIST and put it in the MongoDB database. And then the tools improve over time. Uh, I, I did some modifications. Peter Yan did a lot of modification on, on the uh, website. And we will basically explain all, all the functionalities of the tools uh, in the presentations. But I just wanted to show the history because it's, we are not basically a kind of fixed structure. So we welcome more and more contributions. So if you want to contribute back to the software, uh, we are quite open on regarding contributions. So if you see bugs, security fixes, updates, new data source for vulnerabilities, contribute. It's how it works. So a quick overview of how it works. Um, the key element of, of CV search is to fetch vulnerabilities informations from different sources, put them in a database, and keep them flexible to do cross-references and cross-checking. So you have a, basically a core script called DB Updater. And this Python script, uh, by the way, uh, CV search is written in Python, Python 3. Um, the DB Updater is basically the core element for fetching uh, all the data sources, 
obviously the one from NIST, uh, from the National Vulnerability Database, but from various sources too. So if you want to extend the software to add, I don't know, sources from uh, Oracle, for example, you can fetch the data and then you can create a small modules that will be called by DB Updater. And DB Updater is the one doing uh, all the fetching at regular intervals and doing uh, even the uh, notification for the indexer, for doing full text index and so on. Um, so it's quite modular, it's all small Python script, and then on the back end you have a MongoDB database that is used for storing uh, the documents, so the CV, for example, uh, the, for example, the Microsoft uh, information about vulnerabilities and so on. And then we have an additional caching database called uh, using Redis that we use for the web interface and the API to do fast lookup, especially when you browse element and search specific vendors and so on. So that's a quick functional overview of CV search and how we populate the database. And we try to keep them as simple as possible to extend it to whatever thing that you want in the future. So what do we get right now? Um, the main source of information is basically the NIST. Uh, so it's a work done by MITRE, uh, which is a kind of uh, para-organizational structure from NIST that is doing all the work of uh, collecting and doing assignment for CVE. Uh, but there are additional information that you can use uh, from NIST. For example, there is a common platform enumeration called the CPE, which is very handy. It's basically the classification per uh, machines and operating systems. Uh, and you see that there is a kind of nomenclature used for that one. And then you can find quickly an operating system, a version, and so on in using this CPE. Then you have the CAPEC, the CWE, and you have other databases, like, for example, the official vendor statement, because, as you know, for security researchers, sometimes it can be tough. Look, if you ask for a CVE, sometimes the vendors might complain. So the official vendor statement is additional vendor statement, like, uh, yeah, we know this vulnerability, we, we don't plan to fix it. Yeah, it happens sometimes. So it's a kind of statement that you want to add and to look at it, like that you know the official position of the vendors. And this provides cross-reference um, assignment, too, so you have plenty of reference to for example, MS values, so for Microsoft security vulnerabilities, back to the CVE values, because there are a lot of ID in use, uh, and sometimes it's difficult to find back the uh, information. Then we have two additional sources that are coming from external contributions, so the Microsoft built-in uh, and the exploitation reference from D2 um, uh, D Square, which is a vulnerability framework. And we import another data feed called VFeed, uh, which is doing a great work of cross-referencing, so like that you have additional cross-references from the vulnerability. Things that we are interested in, if you know other public data sources that we can incorporate, let us know because we are very interested in this kind of information. So now that you get all the data into the database, you want to do something with it. So we have a, a myriad and a, some tools that you can use. Uh, basically, the most obvious one is searching, so you can search among, in the MongoDB uh, database for specific things. Uh, I will, we will make some, some examples later on. Uh, you can dump the latest security advisory. You can, for example, classify the security advisory depending of a specific classification that you have internally. Uh, and you have some nifty tools like uh, the search on Jabber or XMPP. So it's a bot that you can plug and then you can query directly and search directly. You have the same for uh, IRC. Uh, we have some additional tools uh, for dumping CVU into ASCII doctor, so you can uh, view it with PDF and so on, so you know for corporate sometimes they want to have you know, those nice PDF and shiny PDF. And they have a, a, a series of tools that are used uh, for the backend system, so the DB tools, and those ones are used for managing the database and adding some specific part. So how it works is when you clone the first repository, um, but you basically fetch for the first time all the uh, information, so you can call the DB updater. Uh, that is straightforward to, to call. Uh, so minus i means that you will uh, be able to do the indexing at the same time, and then when it's imported, it takes some time because uh, the NVD database is more than 16 years old, so you have all the CVE locally now. Then you can start to search, and quick search. Uh, okay, I took Joomla because I think uh, a lot of people are still using this CMS. I don't know why, but okay, it's another story. Um, then you can search on uh, specific product names, in this case using the CPE names, and then it will return you all the matching CVE um, that you will find for Joomla. The screen is too small for Joomla. Um, then you can do additional queries, like for example for a specific CVE, and you will get automatically a JSON uh, 
output with uh, key values uh, containing the vulnerabilities. Here it's uh, again a Joomla reference. Uh, you see that you have um, what we call the vulnerable configuration part. Uh, this one is which version that are vulnerable, and those one are using the CPE values. As you can see that you can have uh, human readable lookups and a machine's uh, readable lookup, so you can both enable or disable the minus N, uh, the CPE value. So you can do a lot of scripts for uh, with um, the JSON output. So just for your information, what is CPE? CPE is a um, static for, static formatted information that you can use for uh, describing uh, a software or an application whatsoever. Uh, so it's designed by NIST. Uh, there are two versions, version 2.2 and 2.3. We support both versions. Uh, this one is a description of version 2.2. So basically, each software can be uh, split into various parts. If it's an operating system element or applications, or applications mean software in their case, uh, you have the vendors, the product, the version, the update. As you know, sometimes you have vulnerabilities that are only applicable for a specific versions or a specific uh, language. That's basically what is for the CPE. Uh, something to keep in mind is also that only the part, vendor, product, and version are required. So sometimes you have strange combinations where you also have the language, but not the addition. There are also other fields apart from the ones that are on the screen, but those are the most important. Yeah, that's quite important because usually sometimes even uh, the target of vulnerabilities is not really clearly defined in a specific version because they have no feedback from the vendor. They know that the product is vulnerable, but they don't know exactly know the versions. And even sometimes, you have vendors having no versions in their software. Yes, this happens sometimes. For Scala system, for example, it's quite, of, quite common. So what can you do with it? Um, a simple one. So for example, you want to check for all uh, the top vendors that are using the word unknown. So, so basically, the security advisory gives a lot of information about vendor practices, what vendors are doing when they receive vulnerabilities, what they disclose about it. And um, here you can do in one, one single Unix command. Um, JQ, it's a very nifty uh, Unix command for parsing JSON files uh, and JSON output. And then you can do whatever things, like, for example, getting a specific key or a specific values. In this case, what we are doing is we search for uh, all the um, security advisory containing unknown. Uh, and then we parse it to just get the famous field the vulnerable configuration. That's the one that you, you saw just before. And out of it, we, we cut the uh, elements. We sort as unique. We count the number of, of time it appears. Uh, and then we take, we take the top 10. And as you see that, for example, there's a, a vendors that you might know, Oracle, have this tendency of setting unknown everywhere. So it's giving a lot of information about practices. You see Oracle and Sona all together. Then you have HP, Google, IBM, Mozilla, whatever. But it's quite interesting because just as looking at how a security vulnerability is defined or described, it gives a slight indication of how the vendor is stretching the vulnerabilities. I think it's quite nifty. Uh, then if you can go deeper, and uh, as, as Peter Yan mentioned, that the, the uh, CP values can be sometimes extend it, so you can have additional information, like, for example, here, the product names. So you are interested more into which product names are usually defined with unknown. And then you see a tendency of one single vendor, for example. Um, Oracle, for example, is, is a regular uh, popping up, because you see that they tend to use unknown for vulnerabilities. What does it mean? Does it mean that the, the, the product is more vulnerable? Not really, but it means that the management of vulnerabilities might be less precise by some vendors or for some product. For some of the product, it could be also that um, they release advisory, but they don't want to give too much details that someone can exploit it before it's fixed. And that's sometimes the approach of, of Google for Chrome, that they don't give all the detail in, at first glance, which is, I think, quite strange, but they do it like that. And then afterwards, we get more details when the patch is completely uh, used and uh, deployed. Um, you can do many things. So um, if you are a fan of, of Unix tools, uh, maybe some people in the audience are using R, the R packages, for statistics. So you can build statistics uh, directly using CVS search. And one of the things that you could do uh, is basically to get the CVSS value. 
And the CVCS value is a value that is calculated on regarding the impact that this vulnerability could have. And then you can basically extract the CVCS value for specific product, and you can even compare the value. So it, it can be used for various things. Uh, imagine that you need to purchase a new software, and you want to see, okay, which one has the tendency of being more vulnerable than the others? Uh, can you compare all both uh, of it? So, for example, when you do a request for proposal for buying a new vendor, maybe you can have a look at this one. Assuming that the vendor is requesting CVE, or at least publishing uh, security advisory, which is not always the case, you can use this as a kind of metric to evaluate if a vendor have a tendency to have uh, highly in impactable uh, vulnerabilities compared to low impact vulnerabilities. And you see uh, uh, an interesting trend. Um, Sun has been purchased back by Oracle at some point in time, so the CPE value changed. So that was quite interesting because at some point in time, Sun has been moved to Oracle, but the old vulnerabilities were still from Sun. And you see that the median for the CVSS uh, from um, Java, and the GRE at that time was GRE, moved from a median of 7.5 to 10 for the CVSS, meaning that the exploitations could lead to a complete uh, abuse of the systems or abuse of the, uh, the vulnerability. So that could be one of the use, but you can do plenty of other statistics with it, um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that you can come out with great idea for, for ranking uh, software. Uh, also, the CVSS is based on the CIA model, so uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and it's also based on uh, how easy it is to exploit. So if it's on a network, if it's local system, um, if it's easy to heart, and uh, all those kind of things. So it's not just what's the impact, but it's also how easy is it to exploit. So it's, also, it's a bit of a risk um, indicator. Right. Something else that we wanted to do is uh, the local exploitation, and I think uh, we have the same problem in our, both organizations. Um, you have in a, a, some huge organization, you have different departments. So the view of the department is depending on what they use as software. So I'm pretty sure some of you are working in the IT field and they might work in the ICT department of uh, big corporations. Then you have a huge accounting department and they might use SAP, for example. So with um, CV Search, what we uh, design is a ranking mechanism, which is very simple. So you can basically add a rank for specific groups uh, matching a specific CPE values. So as an example here, what do you have? We, we created a, a tag which is called accounting, can be anything you want. And if it's uh, containing SAP in the CPE values, it will set uh, a ranking value. The ranking value could be anything you want. So you can have your own scale uh, in the corporate environment. We tend to use uh, zero to something unknown to one, two, three for the uh, ranking up to three. That means that uh, it's highly impactable in the organizations. But you can use it as a new ranking scheme that you use internally. And then you can afterwards use the tools to look into uh, some CV that are matching your ranking. And then, for example, if you have an accounting department having their own IT uh, staff there, you can forward them the specific CV uh, and vulnerability matching those CPE with a high ranking that they need to fix it before some other activities that they have to do. Uh, another example of using ranking, uh, there is a, a tool called Dumplast, which is able to dump the last uh, security vulnerabilities. That's a thing that a lot of security departments are doing, looking at the latest vulnerabilities. Um, what you can do with it is um, you can only dump the one where you have a ranking. So you don't, if you don't, for example, have some software, you don't want to see all the vulnerabilities associated to software that you don't have in your company. So you can use Dumplast, and Minuser means that you just want to see the last vulnerabilities with a specific ranking. Uh, you have different output formats, then you can parse it for uh, things. For example, I know some organizations that are uh, doing it for putting them on the intranet, uh, or the IT staff intranet, so like that they can have a look directly at what they need to, to patch. Something else that you can do with it, it's uh, in the full text uh, search, you have a um, visualization scheme. So it's supporting JSON files where you can see um, terminology that is used or terms. And that's one of the examples of, of usage that you can do with uh, such kind of, of search. Um, this is the uh, 
well, the sc screenshot of the uh, web interface that I made. Um, and on the web interface, you can see three different colors. Um, the black one means it's normal CVE. Um, then the gray one means that you have already seen it. And this is great if you want to keep track of which CVE have I seen, which have I not seen. Um, the one with the eye and in purple is uh, a blacklisted CVE. And on the next slide, you will see that we have a black and a white listing system. Uh, and then, of course, the red one is the whitelisted one. Uh, but the difference between whitelisting and ranking is that we assume that we want to see everything, not only the whitelisted stuff. Uh, an example would be if you have a Linux system. A Linux system does not exist uh, on its own. There is a lot of subcomponents. And you might have not whitelisted all the subcomponents. So if you see one, ah, yeah, maybe this is also vulnerable. And uh, so the second one is uh, where you see the white and the blacklist. Um, this is one, uh, an example of the blacklist. You can blacklist on CPE code, and it uh, works as a, um, a regex. So if you want to say, um, OK, I'm not going to uh, blacklist a specific version, but I'm only going to blacklist up to um, the product, then it will blacklist all the versions. If you want to go a bit more specific or a bit more generic, you can do that as well. Uh, and on the right, you can see the target software. Um, that is for, for example, applications running on uh, Android. Uh, at our company, for example, we don't use Android, so we are not interested at the hundreds of vulnerabilities on Android applications. So we just blacklist uh, all applications running on Android. Uh, the top one is um, an example of the filter. Uh, the filter you can see on here as well, but there it's collapsed. And uh, the filter allows you to, well, filter the CVEs uh, a bit more specifically. Uh, the blacklist and the whitelist, you can either turn them off, uh, on, and then the blacklist will, will hide the CVEs that you have blacklisted. You can turn them uh, off, then they won't mark anything. And you can uh, put them on mark, so then you will also see the blacklisted stuff uh, in the color that you saw on the previous slide. Um, there is the management tool um, repository that I made. Uh, it's just a collection of little scripts that we used that we, I want to share with everyone. Uh, everyone is free to add their own scripts, their own tools. And there is also uh, a few lists of CPEs that I just made while I was uh, doing my work. And one of those uh, lists, for example, is a, a list of content management systems. So if you're not using any content management system, just import that in the blacklist, and you won't see any. Um, we also made an API. Uh, the API is used for um, either your own scripts or tools that we already made. Um, we have the API running in both the normal web server and the minimal version. The minimal version is more or less the same as the previous, so more or less the same as this one, except you don't have these features. Uh, you can search still, but you won't have the, um, the scene CVEs because we're not going to keep track of everyone that's watching it. Uh, you won't be able to black and whitelist for obvious reasons. Um, and the API is in uh, REST format and returns JSON. Um, there is a public version running on the, the cve.circle.lu. Uh, and uh, there are a few queries that you can do. Um, we have the ability to browse a specific vendors, specific products. We also have the um, possibility to just get information from a specific CVE get the, the last CVEs. Um, one that I see is not on the slide is you can also get the CVEs that are applicable for a specific product, specific version, specific whatever. Um, and you can also use a few of our internal um, tools that are used to, for example, do the translation between CPE uh, 2.2 and 2.3. Just, just one thing for the uh, API. There are some pen testers relying on the API for their tools. So if you want to do quick tests and so on, you can use a public API in the configuration, or you can basically run your own uh, installation on your systems. So you can basically use both uh, depending on your needs. So there is no uh, force to use a public API. It's just up to you to decide. 
Yeah, this one is a long story. Um, the, the thing is, um, at some point in time, while we were looking at CV search, it was for a research project that we had um, called Toringe. Uh, it was a pro research project for um, doing analysis at Torexit nodes. So the idea was basically to monitor and what kind of the level of vulnerabilities of end user are uh, using Tor. And at that time, we had no tools for uh, doing automatic detections of those uh, machines that are uh, using, for example, older uh, browsers or older uh, applications. So what we did is, uh, it was a quick hack at that time, so we were uh, using a database with the CVE. So nowadays with CVE search, indeed this could be abused in any way, so that means uh, someone who wants to do automatic exploitations could indeed use CVE search uh, for doing automatic exploitations. Um, so but that's the, the two sides of software, and that's something to keep in mind. Uh, if it's free software, so people can use it for whatever purpose they want. Uh, but always think of what bad guys could do it, with it. Uh, but that means for pen testers, for example, or for people doing uh, security assessment, uh, they can uh, run or do analysis on the pickup files, do fingerprinting of browsers, and then detect which browser uh, could be vulnerable and so on. So that means, yeah, indeed, we write software that could be used by bad guys, but could, could be used for good guys, and until now, we, we have seen a tendency that a lot of people are using for uh, the good, than the bad. Okay, this one is, uh, for us, I'm, I think the most important one. Um, it's looking for uh, open data sources of software vulnerabilities. And I think uh, both of us faced the daily situation where we had wonderful websites from vendors using Flash sometimes, um, publishing sometimes reports in PDF documents with their vulnerabilities, so there's no um, easy way to parse their information and to collect the information. So we want to give a little challenge uh, for you or for vendors. So if a new vendor or software vendor or hardware vendors provide an open data, uh, data source uh, feed that is easily parsable, they are eligible for either one kilogram of Belgium chocolate or a pack of six Orval beers. Um, for the beers, it could be neg negotiable to other beers if needed. Um, but that's, for us, it's really important. And what we have seen in the, the past is that vendors are not really playing fair, not all. Some are going, doing quite well. I mean, for example, Red Hat are publishing all their uh, documents and so on. Uh, Microsoft is going better. Um, but there are still plenty of vendors that are not even publishing their security vulnerabilities. And when they publish something, it's something that you cannot automate or parse it uh, automatically. So if you know one vendor that provides a new feed, um, yeah, they can be eligible for one kilogram of Belgium chocolate. No, the thing is, um, we are interested into data set of using CV search. Uh, when you use CV search, you can enrich the information around vulnerabilities uh, with localized information. Uh, for the case in Luxembourg, what we do, we have a database of all the CVE, and it's linked to the vulnerabilities and the exploitation that we have seen. So that means linked to the incident. So we have a, what we have is a, a list of all the incidents with their CP uh, correspondent, and then we use it to rank the probability of infections or abuse using these vulnerabilities. Then it's really linked to the country, usually, because it's depending on what kind of software you have in the country, and it's depending on what kind of target uh, or attacks you get into your country. So we are really interested in uh, improved or extended classification of the dump. So if at some point you uh, see, for example, for a sector of activity, I mean, industrial sector, you have a list of CPEs, like you mentioned for the CMS, but for example, for the ICS sector, we are interested in this, in, uh, this to incorporate it back into CV search, so like that people can have customized version of CV search for their specific activities. Uh, to be not overloaded with all the information that you get from uh, uh, security uh, vulnerabilities. Um, something that we really want is sometimes we have to push vendors to release their vulnerability information, and that's a very tough one because uh, sometimes they don't want to do it. Uh, sometimes they want to do it, but they change the URLs, I don't know, every two weeks. So if you fetch the information and you have to change the URLs every two weeks, you need to update your software and so on. So it's, Something really important is that should be, I think, in, in vulnerability disclosure of vendors that they provide a way to, get, uh, to give the information. 
Uh, another issue that we have seen is, and I think this one is the trickiest one, uh, the CPE naming convention is coming from, from NIST. Um, and it's very difficult to find the matching with some operating system or some libraries in an operating system. One of the good examples, and you, every one of you I think knows this one, you know OpenSSL, they have some vulnerabilities sometimes. Uh, if you look at Debian, it's not called OpenSSL, but it's sometimes called LibSSL. In some other distribution, it has different names. Uh, and then people are even backporting fixes from one version to another version, but you do, cannot do the matching between the CP names that is mentioned in the vulnerabilities with the real name that you have on your operating systems. And at some point, we really want to give a call to all the vendors to say, okay, guys, it's nice, but please try to have a mapping uh, database with all the CP values, at least from the, uh, each library. I think it will ease the pain of everyone, and it will be a thing for system administrator to better uh, at least be notified of, 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 of security issues. Uh, another problem that we saw with CPE is, um, for example, when Flash is vulnerable on Linux but not on Windows, uh, what they do is not put the Linux part in the CPE like it should be, but they just add both CPEs, uh, CPEs to the vulnerable configuration. So they add the generic uh, CPE for Flash and under that the one for Linux, which is also very difficult if you want to automate um, processing CPEs. Yeah, so if you want to help and if you want to use it, uh, there's two main repos uh, for uh, CV search. Uh, we just, by the way, created an organization yesterday that where all the uh, thing will be. Um, so I'm basically maintaining the stable versions uh, because we have a lot of operational part and Peter Yan have basically the uh, unstable one and we merge uh, every or some weeks and sometimes months depending of uh, the changes back into the uh, version and then you, you have uh, stable versions. Um, so based on that, uh, just to go back to this one, there are other software using uh, CV search uh, that you can use too. Uh, some are written by some other partners, some other people. Um, for example, the CV portal is a notification portal where people can register their software and get notification later on. Um, you can mention maybe CVE scan? Uh, CVE scan is uh, an idea that I had. Um, when you make an NMAP scan, uh, sometimes you can find CPEs in there. So C CVE scan will uh, either work with scans that you already made or scan uh, itself uh, and, or scan all uh, systems. Uh, you can do one or multiple systems, both work, and then it will automatically correlate the CVEs um, so you get a nice overview. It looks the same like in CVE search, uh, a big list of all the CVEs that are applicable to the systems that you just scanned. Uh, and it's not implemented yet, but the next step that I want to do is uh, from there, if there are Metasploit modules available, uh, automatically exploit systems. Uh, it works both on web interface and on terminal. So with, um, I forgot the uh, uh, curses, yeah, that's the, that's the library. And then the uh, management tool is something that I'm working on at the moment. Um, basically what I want to make is a big management tool that can be used um, uh, with CVE search directly. So when new CVEs apply, uh, you can make systems in the management tool, uh, systems where you uh, add all the CPEs and assign teams that have to fix those systems. And when uh, new CVEs pop up, the tool should automatically add um, new tickets to those people that are responsible for the teams with vulnerable software. So we have plenty of idea and, and new things that we want to implement. Um, one of the things that we are um, right now working on and that might be uh, quite important I think in the future is to basically expand the systems to vulnerabilities that does not include CVE assignment. Um, and that's, I think, um, one of the biggest issues nowadays. Uh, you have a lot of software vulnerabilities that never receive a CVE uh, for various reasons. Sometimes the vendor doesn't want to provide it. Sometimes the vendors want to provide it. So what we would like to do is basically using CVE search as a kind of pre-assignment uh, CVE. So that means the web interface or the interface would be there to uh, help uh, someone, a security researcher and so on, to already pre-fill all the information for doing a CV request. If they want to do a CV request, they are doing it, or uh, we keep the information uh, locally and so on. So the, the thing is to basically have a 
kind of vulnerability management within the platforms uh, before that the CVE is really assigned, because for some large organizations, they have even teams that are basically managing their own vulnerabilities, uh, even if those ones are not disclosed. Uh, and going back to that one, we really want that more and more uh, vulnerabilities uh, data sources are included in CVE search. Uh, so if you know about some interesting one and so on, please let us know. The only thing that we have seen in the past as issue is sometimes, sometimes you have re licensing restrictions of the data set. So the one providing the data source is ad putting additional restrictions. Um, and by, by doing so, it's limiting the ability of using CVE search. So we really want that the data source that we get are free, freely accessible and can be reused for whatever purpose. Uh, to go back on that, uh, the data source of vFeed also includes things like um, links to Red Hat advisories, um, exploits and exploit database, exploit using Metasploit and all those information. So those, uh, that information is also very welcome. Um, something that we really want to, to do too is uh, basically improve the data structures to make it a bit more flexible. And um, I think we really want to reduce the code size. Even if the code right now is not so big, uh, as you know, for security, it's not a good thing if we have a huge code base. And we want to keep it as simple as possible. So one of the objectives, too, is to reduce the code size of the systems. So even if we provide more functionalities, is to basically rely on less software. Uh, and obviously, the last one, and this one, we will do a separate, separate project for that. Uh, it will be a documentation, not only for the one using CVE search, uh, but especially for the one contributing to ease people to contribute back to the systems, uh, especially regarding adding new modules or new data sources. Um, we will provide the documentation, uh, how to use the API, how to use the libraries, uh, and how to, to get the data format into the database. Uh, an ex a good example from that is that uh, in the code, we have a library uh, purely for querying data. And uh, one of the developers uh, that wanted to contribute uh, basically rewrote the entire query uh, library because he didn't know it existed and didn't really look for it either. So we also want to make it easier for people that want to develop so they know what is available, what's not available, uh, how to write code so that we keep a generic format and that it's easier to review later. And the thing is, so basically, I think that's it for, for today. Um, so if you want to contact us, here is our contact details. If you have some idea or extension that you want to see in CVE search, let us, let us know. Even if you don't want to code it, feel free to open an issue with an idea. We, we welcome new idea or new things that could be implemented. Uh, so go on GitHub, open an issue, and then we will have a look at it.